Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have a book from a viewer, and I have a finished 1970s vintage sweater, which is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. This tidbit came to me in a direct message from Charlotte on Ravelry. It's a video on traditional wool processing in the Pyrenees. It's a video on traditional wool processing in the Pyrenees by Eugenio Monesma, who's a Spanish documentarian. The link Charlotte sent was from Facebook, and that version of the video has English voiceover narration and closed captions. I did find the same video on YouTube, which has the voiceover in Spanish, but you can click on the closed caption icon in the playback screen and get English subtitles. So Manesma it has a group of videos that feature what he calls lost trades. And this video features several women from the Pyrenees who demonstrate their process for scouring wool, preparing it for spinning, both combing and carding. And then the wool is spun using a drop spindle. And then the method that she used to create a two-ply yarn was really interesting to me. She wound the singles from the two different spindles together into a single ball, and then she plied the singles from that ball together with another spindle, and that one had a weight on it and seemed to be suspended in a different way than when she was actually spinning the singles. Once you get the yarn, then you see another woman who talks about um, knitting socks. And throughout the video, the women are talking about growing up, learning these skills and using them whenever they were, even when they were out in the fields with the shepherds and the sheep. So this video is by the same documentarian who produced another film that I've shared previously in Tidbits, also of women in the Pyrenees. So it's interesting to compare the two different groups of women, the two fin, the two films, and uh, how these different groups talk about their lifelong experience with wool and the techniques that they use and, and what they do with um, the wool once it's been turned into yarn. So I'll leave links to both the Facebook version of the film and the YouTube version. And if I can find it, I'll also include a link to the other video of women from the Pyrenees who work with wool. The YouTube version of the video is on Eugenio Monesma's channel, so you can take a look at all of the other documentaries he's filmed as well, which covers a lot of different topics. So I'm not sure where I got this next tidbit from. If somebody out there sent this to me via direct message, I just can't figure it out. I really do try to record where I find these tidbits when I get them and I'm pasting the links into my document, but I frequently fail to do so. So I apologize if it was you. At any rate, it's a video that shows the process of creating machine knit sweaters in a Korean knitwear factory. From the dyeing of the yarn through the assembly of the sweater and the finishing touches, it's amazing to me to see how much labor and skill is involved in so-called machine-made clothing. The knitting aspect is very much automated but so much of the rest of the process involves far more human intervention than you might think. In particular, there's a lot of precision involved in doing things like inserting plackets and creating buttonholes and sewing on the buttons, as well as the finishing involved in washing and pressing the final product. So I do encourage you uh, to take a look at this because I think we often fail to appreciate just how much work goes into something that is machine made. And I will leave a link down below to that video. 
This tidbit came to me on Ravelry and I'll put the username of the person who sent it to me on the screen. I always have a hard time kind of parsing out usernames into something pronounceable, but I'm going to guess <laughs> that it's pronounced friendly tech ed. I hope that's how it is. Uh, so I've been talking a lot lately about Elizabeth Zimmerman's 1971 book, Knitting Without Tears. It's the book I'm using to knit the 1970s installment of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s, as I mentioned almost every week. Uh, the book includes a variety of garments and accessories and how to knit them but the instructions are presented in a very conversational way. It's not a numbers-based um, sequential list of instructions, the way so many patterns were at that time and even the way many patterns are written today. It comes across as a, as a friendly way of understanding how these kinds of garments and accessories are knit and pretty easy to follow along and she will often throw in, oh, use this technique um, to, if you're doing this type of thing or if you wanna do this, if you wanna add this little feature to your, your um, garment, then you can use this technique and she just kind of throws them in in mid-sentence. So it can sometimes be hard to find something that you know is in the book. Like you read it, you know it's in there and you're, tr you're flipping through trying to, trying to find it. Now the book does have an index in the back, but it is fairly brief. What Friendly Tech Ed has done is create an online index of the book that allows you to pinpoint more precisely what page something is on in the book so that it's a much more extensive index. You, of course, you can't read the book online, but if you're struggling to find something you know is in Knitting Without Tears and you can't find it, her index might be really helpful in your treasure hunt. And of course, I will leave the link down in the show notes as I always do. An unexpected package arrived in my PO box yesterday, sent to me by Christine in Rhode Island. And without thinking, I just opened it up um, to see what was inside and I didn't record it. What she sent me was uh, a copy of a book called Knitting America. I will go to the overhead in a second and kind of uh, let you see what's inside. It's a book that was published about 15 years ago um, by a publisher that's right here in the Twin Cities. They publish a lot of sort of coffee table style books. So I hadn't looked through this book in some time, so it was a real pleasure to flip through it again and remind myself of some of the gold that's in there. I have a tendency to Google things when I have a question about knitting history, uh, forgetting that what might be on the shelves of my knitting library or in, on the shelves of the textile library. So let's go to the overhead and I'll show you what is in this book. So the book is called Knitting America and it is, was written by Susan M. Strawn and it says a foreword by Melanie Fallick. So this book again is called Knitting America and it should not be confused with the book called Knitting in America that was written by Melanie Fallick who wrote the foreword of Knitting America. <laughs> Just to make that clear. So this book goes through all the different types of, of knitting, what was going on historically uh, within knitting at different periods of time in our history. And um, they've got photographs of people that are doing reenactments um, and they have, um, they've got information about indigenous people who uh, learn to knit. And um, they also have quite a few uh, knitting patterns in here. So it's really fun to see a lot of these different images, but also, um, and they have things like uh, catalog images and how much things cost, um, photographs of people um, knitting uh, taken at different points in history. Uh, they also have sections on knitting as um, 
three-dimensional sculptural art as well. Um, and then there's this, this amazing photograph here of Mary Walker Phillips, Elizabeth Zimmerman, and then Barbara Walker, the three of them all knitting together. So I've mentioned a number of times that these two women who were publishing books in the early 1970s were friends, they knew each other, they mentioned each other in each other's books. So uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I, lo I always love this photo every time I see it. I don't know if it's still in print or not, but it's probably available used or through your library. I'm sure our textile center has got a copy of this. So this is a really interesting book if you're interested in knitting history and vintage knitting just to kind of get a feel for different eras and different regions and different types of knitting and uh, what knitters were doing in different decades. It's a really fascinating book. Uh, thank you so much to Christine who sent this along. So I have finished my 1970s vintage sweater. This is the latest installment in my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade, from the 1890s to the 1990s. And I have all of the sweaters up to and including uh, 1970s. And actually I have my 1980s sweater because I have a sweater uh, that was knit from a 1980s pattern that I knit at or in around 1990 and it has a lot of the features that I would be looking for in a 1980s sweater. There isn't a lot for me to learn from that era since that was when I learned to knit and I'm always looking for something new uh, and different in this project in order to understand the evolution of the hand knit sweater pattern from the, in that time span. The only other sweater I have left is my 1990s sweater. I do have some ideas about what I am going to do for my 1990s sweater. I'm still thinking it through and I'll talk about it more in a few weeks, but I wanted to go over the different features of this sweater. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about uh, the sleeves because this is a seamless set in sleeve construction and it's quite different from the set in sleeve seamless set in sleeve constructions I have done previously and I will compare her method to one that would be more familiar to those of you who may have done seamless set in sleeve construction which would be Barbara Walker's um, one of her methods she she had two of them so the pattern for this sweater came from Knitting Without Tears, as I've mentioned a number of times. It's the kangaroo pouch sweater in chapter five, and it's called a kangaroo pouch sweater because when you get up to the armholes and you put uh, stitches on waist yarn and you continue working in the round, this uh, bit here, the underarm stitches, kind of form what looks like a kangaroo pouch. It doesn't look like a kangaroo pouch once you've cut it and you knit the sleeves, but during the process of knitting the sweater, it looks a little bit like a kangaroo pouch. I explained uh, uh, quite a bit last week about how the body of this sweater is knit. It's knit completely in the round up to the shoulders, which means that the armhole openings were cut in order uh, to create the hole. Uh, so if you, if you miss that one, you can watch uh, that episode and I, I go through how that's done. So I have hems at the, at the bottom of the sweater body as well as the bottoms of the sleeves. So the body was knit bottom up, the sleeves were knit top down. Um, I do have a neck opening here. The opening was square shaped and I was kind of interested to see how that was actually going to turn out and what it would look like when it's worn. It actually just kind of, it looks pretty curved at the bottom. It kind of just looks like a U shape, even though I didn't intentionally shape it that way, just the way the knitting pulls, um, it does uh, do that. So I'm really happy um, with the sweater uh, and much happier than I would have been if I knit a 1970s sweater in some kind of garish acrylic in a wild, ugly design. Much happier having designed my own version using uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman's guidelines for how this type of sweater is to be knit. I'm going to uh, try the sweater on and model it for you so you can see what it looks like on my body. And then we will go to the overhead and I will talk quite a bit about seamless set in sleeve construction so you can understand how these 
or get a taste anyway of how these types of sleeves are knit because that was the part that was most interesting to me about this sweater. So this is the view of the sweater from the front. Let me pick up my microphone and then you guys can see it from behind. And then I will sit down and you can see the neck a little bit better. So you can see it's it's pretty nicely curved around here. I'm just really pleased with how it turned out. Um, really happy with it. I think this is going to be one of the sweaters that I actually do put in my uh, rotation pretty often this winter. Uh, some of the sweaters that I've knit in this project, I knew from the start that I would not be wearing them and others I do wear occasionally. But this one, this one is really great. I really like it quite a lot. The yarn that, that I use for this sweater is a fine Peruvian Highland wool from Marisol and the specific yarn is called Huni. I believe the color is sapphire. I don't know if it's written on here somewhere. Yes, yeah, sapphire is the, the name of the color. And it's kind of a heathery color. I really uh, like this quite a lot. So I wanna go through the process of the satin sleeve that Elizabeth Zimmerman instructs. And the re this, is, this is really the reason I wanted to knit this sweater is because I'd never seen a seamless set-in sleeve constructed in this way. I explained last week how the body was knit. It was knit totally in the round, including between the underarm and the shoulders. And then the stitches were cut open here in order to create the armhole opening. So it didn't, doesn't have to be in reality, you could you could knit flat um, for the front and knit flat for the back and then join the shoulders and you'd have the armhole. You could do that. You could knit top down and, and do that as well. So Elizabeth Zimmerman really liked knitting, like she liked the knit stitch and she tried to avoid purling as much as possible. So to her, uh, steaking was an appealing solution to the problem of a seamless uh, set in sleeve. So the opening for an armhole has a larger circumference than the circumference of the sleeve around your bicep. So what Elizabeth Zimmerman um, called for doing was picking up stitches at a ratio of two stitches for every three rows. And that's because you always have more rows per inch than stitches per inch because uh, stitches are rectangular. So if you have two inches of fabric in rows and you want to pick up enough stitches to knit two uh, inches worth of fabric that wide that's going in that direction perpendicularly, you, you can't pick up one stitch for every row. You have to pick up uh, fewer stitches than, the, than there are rows. So, so she's suggesting two stitches for every row all the way around here. And then there's a number of stitches that have been held on uh, waist yarn while uh, this upper part was knit in the round. Her next instruction, and I'm not sure why she does it, I went ahead and did it to see how it would work. Uh, and I would like to try uh, this sleeve again without doing this particular step. But the after picking up all of the stitches, she instructs to uh, knit all the stitches in the round for a full inch. So that's going to extend uh, everything out one inch away from the pickup. And then she starts doing the shaping. And she she does it as if, if you've ever knit a sock with a heel flap and gusset and you've had to do a heel turn, it's exactly that same process. So after you've knit around enough times to have an inch's worth of fabric uh, extending away from that edge, you knit all the way up to the top and then 
you knit an inch past that. So if you are knitting in worsted weight yarn and you have five stitches per inch, you'd be knitting five stitches um, past. And then she has you work a decrease and then she has you work one more stitch. And then you turn and now the wrong side is facing. So this is the only time in this garment where if you're knitting entirely in stockinette where you'd be doing purling, you'd be is for the purposes of this sleeve cap. So you turn the work, the purl side's facing, you slip that stitch that you worked after the decrease, and then you purl everything up to that top point, and then you knit five stitches past or one inch past, and then you do a decrease. So it's purl two together, and then you work a stitch. And then you turn, so now the right side is facing again, and you slip that last stitch that you worked, and you go all the way back across until you get to that previous turning point and you can recognize it because there is a gap between that last stitch that you worked and the stitch the first stitch that hasn't been worked there's a visible gap between those so you're going to work each of those stitches on 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 each side of that gap you're going to work them together and then you're going to work another knit stitch and then you're going to turn slip and you're going to go back again till you get to this gap and you're going to knit the stitches on either side of the gap together and then knit one more or purl one more stitch. So you're gonna keep repeating that back and forth. So you are decreasing the number of stitches as you are going back and forth. You are increasing um, more rows across here where you have been working stitches every time and you have less fabric over here and to, to the turning point because you are working these short rows. They're getting gradually longer and longer and you are having ending up with fewer and fewer stitches on the needles. So once you are down to the number of stitches that you need for your sleeve circumference here, then you stop doing the short rows and decreases and you return to working in the round. Um, and then and you work in the round and then you have to do shaping uh, as you go down the sleeve to do your decreases. So that is her method of doing this. And again, I had never seen that particular method of doing the short row shaping. What I had done before was Barbara Walker's method. Barbara Walker published her book, Knitting from the Top, a year after Knitting Without Tears was published. And in her book, she starts the sweater from the shoulders. Um, you, you, uh, you knit the back. You have some shoulder shaping to create you know, the slope of the shoulder and you knit it uh, to the underarms. And then you pick up stitches and you knit the, the fronts and do your neck shaping until you get to the underarms. And then you would join in the round. And at some point after you have joined in the round, you could finish the body or you could just go on hold at the moment you would come back and you would do the sleeves. The way she does it is she has you know, well, how many stitches are you gonna want or for your circumference of your upper arm? And that's the number that she has you pick up around the armhole. So you're picking up at a less frequent rate using Barbara Walker's method, which means instead of picking up two stitches for every three rows, sometimes you might pick up two and then skip the third, but sometimes you might uh, pick up one and then skip one. So there's a lot more skipping. And so there's a little bit more gapping with this, but you have the full number of stitches that you're going to need for the upper arm. And so rather than working short rows back and forth where you're also decreasing, like you would for the heel turn of a heel flap and gusset construction, Barbara Walker's method is to work a short row heel. So not one that has a heel flap, but a short row heel. And the way short row heels uh, are worked in socks is that um, the number of stitches that you have for your heel, the center third of those are not short rowed. And that's what Barbara Walker is doing here. So with Barbara Walker, you pick up stitches all the way around so that you have the number of stitches you're going to need for the sleeve. You come back up to the top and you work one sixth of the way past so that you have a third of the stitches up here or where you're marking the start of your short row turns. And you use a regular short row turn. You could, she used wrap and turn short rows. You could use German uh, short rows. You could use shadow wrap short, or you could use whatever kind you wanted. So you'd go um, 
past that last turn um, one stitch more each time uh, as you went around until you get around to where the horizontal stitches are. You wouldn't short row those. So she has a wider top of the sleeve cap and kind of a narrower underarm where, Barb, uh, where Elizabeth Zimmerman has a fairly narrow upper part of the sleeve cap and a wider underarm. So uh, once that sleeve cap is complete, and I will put a picture of what the sleeve cap looks like after the short rows are done. Uh, once that's done, then you work going down the sleeves right here. So there's another difference in how Elizabeth Zimmerman is telling knitters to work their sleeve sleeves versus how Barbara Walker tells them. Elizabeth Zimmerman has a specific formula. She tells you to knit about seven, until you have about seven or eight inches worth of knitting done in the sleeve, and then you start the shaping. So on my arm, that's nearly down to my elbow. It would have been about down to here. Um, she would have just wanted it done straight and then doing two decreases um, at the seam side every fifth round until you're down to the number that you want. So Elizabeth Zimmerman is using a percentage system. She is instructing 30, I think like a third of the number of stitches that you have for the bust, she's saying to use for the upper part of the arm. Uh, Barbara Walker, I think, tells you to measure your arm and decide how big you want it uh, using your gauge. Elizabeth Zimmerman's having you do uh, every fifth round decrease until you're down to the number that you need. If, if the sleeve is as long as you want it to be and you haven't finished reducing them, then she would say, uh, well, decrease out the extra before you do your ribbing. That seemed like kind of a weird shape of a sleeve to me. And I really did want to use instructions from the 1970s, but that was a sleeve instruction like I had never seen for shaping. I think it's just a formula that she uses, used that she figured it would work for any gauge for any size, that you would get all the, the shaping you needed in pretty much um, if you were working in this direction, uh, you would get it all done before you got to the armhole and you just work straight. If you're working down, she's having you, you knit a certain amount and then do your shaping. And if you run out of room, you have to um, get it all done before you do your, uh, your ribbing. So uh, that was her method where Barbara Walker tells you to actually calculate it and she tells you how to go about calculating it for an even decrease between the underarm and the ribbing and that's what I'm accustomed to and it produces a very smooth you know angled line and so I used Barbara Walker's method that she used in her book because that's what I'm used to that's a shape that I like and uh, I didn't really like the way that Elizabeth Zimmerman's sleeve shape was going to turn out. It just didn't, I wasn't convinced that I would uh, like it. Barbara Walker had another method for doing a seamless set in sleeve. Um, and that method was to uh, start at the back of the neck, do your shoulder shaping, and then uh, once the shoulder shaping was done, you'd have more rows right here than you would here because this needs to be uh, taller. Once that shoulder shaping was done, then she instructs to, to knit the back to a certain length that's uh, about one sixth of whatever the, the circumference of the sleeve was going to be. Then you would pick up stitches along the shoulder and you do the shoulder shaping for there. And again, you would do your neck shaping while you, you knit down that one sixth uh, of the circumference of the sleeve as well. And you'd repeat that over here. So once you had the, uh, the upper part of the back and the upper part of the bodice, once you had that, then what you would do is you would knit across these stitches and then you would pick up along that edge that you'd been creating. You'd knit across the back, then you, again, you'd pick up across uh, the top here and you'd knit across there. And then you would uh, knit back and forth until you'd finished your neck shaping. And if you were knitting a pullover, you would knit in the round. And while you were doing that, 
you would be adding increases on the sleeve side, not on the body side like you would for a raglan, but only on the sleeve side. So that is something she called simultaneous set in sleeves. So you, once you get um, the, the flat part of the upper body established, then you can begin working um, seamlessly back and forth or in the round in order to do your uh, uh, sleeve cap shaping at the same time that you're knitting the upper body. So um, she came up with those two methods uh, in her book that was published a year after Knitting Without Tears. And I think that those methods caught on. They are still used today. Many different designers have tweaked these, refined Barbara Walker's methods. But I really haven't seen anybody use Elizabeth Zimmerman's uh, method of shaping, and which I find interesting because um, it is a very familiar way of shaping. You can you can do this without having steeked first. You can you can uh, create this armhole the same way that you would have created Barbara Walker's, um, and in fact, before I ever saw Elizabeth Zimmerman's method. I really didn't like the gappiness that Barbara Walker's method had by picking up so few stitches around that armhole. And so what I have always done is picked up at a ratio that was correct for the armhole. And then I would decrease, uh, either in a round, a decrease in a, in a round till I was down to the stitch count I needed for the short rows, or in some cases, I would uh, decrease what I needed as I came up to the shoulder here. And then as I was short rowing on this side, I would do my decreases. That's way more complicated um, than I think is necessary. Um, but there are just multiple ways of riffing off of different ideas. I think um, both of them had really clever solutions for using basically sock heel turns to uh, do shoulder cap shaping. Um, and many, many designers have played off of Barbara Walker's ideas to create um, top-down seamless uh, sweaters with set-in sleeves uh, today. Um, it's not the same as a contiguous uh, set-in sleeve. That's a different process than the simultaneous set-in sleeve that Barbara Walker uh, developed. But I wanted to let you guys know all of the different uh, variations that were going on in the early 70s with seamless uh, set-in sleeves. I want to talk a little bit about Elizabeth's percentage system as it pertains to this sweater, as well as some of the guidelines that she gives that aren't necessarily percentages, they might just be absolutes. And knowing that different people are shaped differently and what she is suggesting may not turn out to be something that you would want to work and it might turn out to be perfectly fine. So she always starts with a key measurement which is the circumference of your sweater. If you want something that's really a large, it has a lot of extra ease, then everything else is going to have quite a bit of extra ease. If you decide to make your sweater with no ease or very little ease, then that will be true for all of the other parts because everything else is a percentage. But if, you, if your body does not conform to whatever her percentage system is expecting, it, the percentages still may not work for you. So it's good to get a sense of, well, what is she, what is she saying the uh, percentage I should use? What is that actually going to be? How is that going to fit on my actual body part? Do I think I'm going to like that or not? So uh, I have a bust circumference that's about 37 inches. Um, and I decided to make a sweater with a very small amount of ease, 38 inches. So um, my key measurement, my body circumference for the sweater was 38 inches. She is suggesting that the upper part of the sleeve uh, that goes around the bicep be 33% of whatever your key measurement is. Because this is close fitting, that's going to, to result in a close fitting sleeve. And then at the wrist, she's suggesting 20%. And so, I looked at what those actual percentages were and then I 
I wanted to just confirm that I thought that was going to fit, particularly around the waist or around the wrist. I thought that was kind of small. And because I was putting hems in, which was going to add some thickness at the wrist, I really wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be too tight. By the time I was knitting the sleeve, I had knit the complete body with a, a hem. And so I was able to um, put my arm uh, through it and measure around what I thought would be a comfortable fit that would be not super sloppy. I didn't want something super huge. I wanted something that, that fit me, but I didn't want something that was really tight. And so I just measured that and then I counted how many uh, stitches I had in that. And I knew that having that many stitches and having a hem um, to increase that thickness in there was going to fit me just, just fine. And it turned out that 20% worked perfectly for me. So those percentages worked really well for me. I, I'm a very medium sized person. I don't have any um, parts of my body that really skew too much from normal. It's my, it's my feet where I have trouble following formulas. So these are some sleeves. She was suggesting, this is just that um, sleeve cap shaping that's done with the short rows. She was suggesting that the sleeve be knit for seven inches, seven to eight inches before starting the decreases and then working them every fifth round. So I looked at how many rows that was going to take to get down to that 20% and then how much longer I was going to want my sleeve. And so I could get an idea of what that sleeve was going uh, to look like. And so then I tried a few different um, other decrease rates just to see um, what I thought it would look like. So here I thought, well, what if I had two inches here and then I decreased every ninth round, I would go right down to the very, very end with no, nothing straight at all. Here I had uh, every seven rounds, I had three inches right here. I could do it every seven rounds and I'd still end up with a half an inch of straight. Uh, and then this one was every sixth round with seven inches right here. There's just, the, and I could go all the way to this. So I was just trying a few different things. What I ended up doing is knitting straight so that I had two inches of straight right here. And then I worked my decreases every seven rounds and then that gave me some straight a more of a uh, space for for knitting straight for the wrist and um, then I had a plan that if I actually needed additional length um, because my diamond stitch pattern was going to end right there if for some reason I needed more length I could do a little bit of a moss stitch cuff for however long would be necessary in order to get the total length I needed. So that was how I, I plan working um, from the top down with my stitch pattern that I wanted to be laid out in a very specific way and end in a very specific way. But I also wanted a more gradual um, sleeve decrease. So I, I mapped it all out in all different ways and, and then decided what worked for me. And this is more or less the, the, the method that Barbara Walker is talking about is, is figuring out after a couple of inches, you know, how much space you have, how many decreases you need to work, and then what that rate is. I've done a video on, on calculating these sorts of decreases because this is, can be something that you might need if you are knitting a pattern and your row gauge is very different or even just slightly different from what the pattern suggests, your sleeve could end up too long or uh, your decreases could end way f uh, more quickly than you would like to just because your row gauge is different. And, or you may have longer arms or shorter arms and you might need to change the shaping rate in order to work out for the length of your arm. So I do have a, a video on this technique and I will uh, link to it above. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.